Okay, I think we are live, Ryan. I'm just gonna bring you on. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully, everybody's tuned in and can hear us. I'm going to just check our page here to make sure that we are live. Before we do too much chit-chatting, to make sure that the stream is working. And I believe the stream is working. Let me just pull it up here. I know, guys. I, I know, guys. What you're, I know, guys. What you're thinking? This new coffee thing is crazy. We've got Leah here talking, and it's just totally different. But it's going to be even better. I promise you this. Okay, we think everybody can hear us. If you can hear us, Neil, you're in the house. Paul's in the house. Elma Canuck is in the house. Barbie and Gerard and Molly Marley Holt is in the house. If you can hear us, give us a thumbs up to let us know that you are watching. Before we bring yeah. on our special guest for this morning's version of Laugh Lion Coffee Talk. Yes, hey, and like super morning to everyone. It's quite a bit cooler, still a bit of humidity, but cool, cool, 17 degrees. Um, what do we want to talk about here before? We're going to let these birds up before we get into the coffee talk. Again, uh, the five birds. The auction now has moved up to $350. Uh, Bill Wemus got the bid. Uh, that will close tonight at 8 p.m. Or we're going to close it live on Facebook around 8 p.m. Uh, good chance you got five birds, five opportunities right now at 350. Again, the next bid uh, we can take it is to 360. We like to move in $20 increments, so it would go to 360, then it would go to 380, or you can just say hell, then go to 500. And still at this point, you're still saving $50. All the money's going into the pot. We got uh, amazing four, uh, three amazing prizes per race, four sprint races. I think fourth place now is uh, is over 450, so or 470. Yeah, current money in the pot right now with Bill Lina's $350 bid, we're at uh, $8,850. Wow, are we going to hit the nine number? It is pretty damn exciting, Lee. Great, great concept. It's working great. Uh, now it comes down to the birds to do the uh, to do the dirty work for us. Keep the entertainment going. Absolutely. Frank Eichhorn is in the house. Shall we bring on our special? guest or should we take a look at the loft here first right uh oh i did a little i hit the wrong button i shut my camera sorry we got the camera back go. on sorry i want to hit the reverse okay so what i'll do is before dave starts talking let me get these kidlets out again they got a nice breeze today looking like it's south wind looks like the heat's going to pick back up sometime here Woo! now they've got a little more feeding them than i like but that's okay it's okay not a big deal. Uh, Leah, I'm not going to set... Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set the camera down. I'll just take my earbuds out of my ears and set them down. The kids okay. are all in the hallway. Perfect. So we're just going to let talk. Ryan let, let the kids out. And oh. uh, we've got Dave on the hotline. We're going to wait to bring him on uh, and wait for the birds to go up. And then we're going to bring no. Dave on. So get your questions ready. All righty, kid. Time to go to work now. Ah. Billy Jones, thanks for tuning in. Hey guys, ready to go? Hi Leah. Oh. Come on. Come on, Bobby. I'm not in on yet, right there. Uh you're not on, but I think everybody can hear you. <laughs> Letting Ryan let the birds out for this morning's Olaf fly. Okay, I've got my earbuds are back in. Let the games begin. Neil, 
Rachel wants to know, was that Ricky we heard in the background? Uh, I don't know. If you heard snoring, it could have been Ricky. You know, uh, could have been. Could have been Ricky. Could have been, should have been. They're up, they got, some of them got about a quarter crop, a little less than a quarter crop of feeding them. So the trapping is going to be an all piss time low, but that's a positive because the flying should be pretty darn good. So sometimes you got to, uh, what is it, pay Peter to save Paul or I don't know. Something I don't know like if that, that makes sense. Something like that. Anywho, should we introduce Dave on? Dave, is, 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 do you want to introduce him on or how do you want to do this? Certainly all the way from Nova Scotia, we have Mr. Dave Ottaway in the house. Let me get the split screen up so everybody, there we go. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. Yes, Dave. Thank thanks you for, so much thanks. For, 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 tuning, for tuning in to our first coffee talk. Ryan, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay. Uh, question for people. People, if you have a question, we're going to get to each of your questions. Uh, just give it a shot here. Give it a time. So don't bombard. Let one question go at a time. Uh, if there's no questions, I'm going to ask questions. So I think the first question I'm going to ask is, Dave, Give us a little history breakdown of how you got into this crazy sport. Because I originally, weren't you a professional curler? Well, uh, in the beginning, um, I was 12 years old and I was born and raised on a farm uh, just in the Barrie area in Ontario. And uh, all young boys on a 150 acre farm had a gun. <laughs> and gun out shooting and wild pigeon shooting was the name. Of, it was just, you know, the story of the day. So, anyways, I uh, shot this wild pigeon because my dad didn't like him around the barn, shitting on everything, and it had a band on its leg. So, I found this band, and I didn't know exactly what it, what the heck it was, and I thought I'd done something really, really bad, like the Ministry of Agriculture or something, or somebody was tracking this bird with this band, and yeah, I phoned around, couldn't get any answers, so my job was 12-year-old, fine. So then about uh, a year later, I was in high school, and I was telling some guys about this bird with the band, and one fellow said, well, go ask that guy over there. He keeps him in the backyard. So, and his name was Ray West from the very recent Bitten Club. So this was 1968. And I explained uh, the racing pigeon, and I got my dad to drive me over there a couple of weeks later, and I came home with three pair of pigeons and had them over since. And, uh, I think I'm in my 52nd year, uh, feeding and uh, feeding pigeons uh, and raising pigeons. And that's how I got started, anyways. And uh, it's been good to me. That's well, that's fine. Excellent. Uh, Leah, any questions so far on the line? All right. I can't see any of the questions. Uh, no. So as the questions come up, uh, Leo, I have to reiterate them. Yeah, so Leah, if you have any questions, just let us know. Uh, Dave, what? Uh, oh, Leah, there you're there now, Leah. I can hear you. Yeah, we've any got questions? Uh, no, no, no questions yet, but uh, Neil oh. Gonzalez <laughs> is giving Dave a shout out. Thank you, Neil. Birds are flying excellent this morning. Okay, Dave. Uh, when you started flying, I know you're you've you've been at the top of the game for quite a while. When you you started, just like a lot of people, you didn't know nothing. You were a kid. When did you? How long did it take you to get into racing? And when you started, I'm sure you weren't the best right off the the hop. You're probably down at the bottom, like everybody else. Yeah. Well, like I said, it was around 1968 that I got uh, around November, October of 68 when I first got my pigeons. I never really started racing until 1970 when I joined the Barry Racing Pigeon Club. And you know, back then. Uh, you know, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, everything was a big secret. All the all the experienced flyers wouldn't tell you nothing for fear of losing the wind divisions. Now, I raced in the Berry Club for a total of about 23 years, uh, but it took me eight years to get to even get in the in the top 20 on the race sheet because I had no instruction. But then I, I met a friend. Uh, called Sammy Marshall. Now, Ellen Johnson, uh, she tuned in to the station. It was her grandfather. And uh, I've known Ellie ever since she was a two or three year old running around uh, with our <laughs> grandfather's knees. Sort of Ellie. And uh, there was a bit of history there with, with Ellen and myself and, and the grandfather. And so Sam, he taught me how to uh, train the pigeons, feed the pigeons, and, and breed. And uh, I still use a lot of his breeding methods today with the long breeding. 
And uh, before long, with Sam's help, uh, I was starting to win races. And, uh, and it kind of progressed from there. Right. So, so you were lucky enough to find a, a veteran to, to help you out. And, did you, and that, you found that moved you up the ladder quite a bit quicker. Yes, definitely. Uh, and, you know, and I, I know I'm doing all these. This year, I'm taking on this little project of doing videos uh, on Facebook of my um, most of my daily activities with the pigeons. And uh, as I said in my other video there uh, a few times, a few videos ago, I don't do this to be to get a pat in the back. And I'm not doing uh, what I'm doing there to, to make myself look good. I knew, I remember when I was young, nobody was there to show me. Now we, we've got social media. Social media can go all over the world. So my idea here uh, with also uh, trying to expand the club and bring in new members is to help the, uh, the new members. It doesn't matter what your age is. Uh, and I can show you by what I do and then back it up with results uh, at the end of the week. Uh, and hopefully I can help some of the new people uh, move along a lot quicker and be more competitive. So right. I do have a lot of uh, people texting me saying more videos, more videos, keep it on. So, uh, you know, that, that tells me that I'm doing something uh, positive and, and that's the whole goal. Perfect. Yeah. And, and I noticed there, I see one of your videos uh, not only are you, you helping teach people little tricks and, and or to be confident with their birds, but I, I noticed on one of the videos that I thought was really good, you'd set your camera up on the side of the road and you were letting out your birds. And sure as hell, the pigeons draw two guys in that used to have pigeons or one didn't have pigeons. And they brought people's interest, like just on, on the road in Nova Scotia, in the middle of nowhere, they brought people right to you to discuss, you know, possibly new membership because i know now they're in nova scotia you started off when you went up there a couple of years ago uh, what was the pigeon sport like there because i don't think there was any from what i remember when we were talking into the rum nog well when i moved to nova scotia i, I was <clears throat> actually done with pigeons. i had as everybody knows i had the, the total auction sale and i was finished um but anyway when i got out here uh somebody uh, let me know that there was a club out here and i Oh, I didn't really realize that. So I called Andy Scroboot from Latour La Mira Times. He used to run the, the one loft race uh, out here. And um, he put me on to uh, another guy named Carlisle Smith. And so in, long story short, I, I, I phoned this guy and we got talking. And, and before you know it, you know, I got an $8,000 uh, pigeon coop set up and uh, and now I'm, I'm going like crazy. So there was four guys when I got here. I was the fifth. And, and now we've got 11 uh, members. Uh, and there's still a couple of people uh, that I communicate with uh, that want to rate. So we're, we're not done organizing uh, new members. Yet. Well, and that, that's, that's actually, it's, it's great to see that you're able to, to get it kind of jump started. Now, the new guys that are in your area, because again, these new guys that are flying against you, uh, you're a, you're a, you know the the tricks of the trade, the name of the games, and I see I see the last few weeks you're right up at the top, uh, which I you know which is not a surprise to me. How are the guys in the club taking it, uh, learning? Like how are they taking it? Are they discouraged? Are they going? Oh, this Dave Ottaway is killing me every week. I'm going to quit. How do you find that? How's them around the club? Uh, what are you? What's your thoughts on that? Well, it's actually very good. Um... You know, the, the, there's the, the, most of the guys in the club I've given some of my pigeons to. And uh, I've also given them tips on uh, how to feed, how to train, how to use the lights to uh, retard the molt. And, again, those guys are watching my videos as well. But we have to, at the club, you know, I openly speak about what I do. And it's, and it's a training process for these guys. And, you know, and, and well, no insult intended, but when I first got here, uh, you know, it was kind of easy, but it's getting hard now. I see there's, there's four guys in the club now that really, really, really picked up the game. And like last week, 32 seconds behind me. This week, a minute and 45 seconds. 
the guys are in the van hiking distance. And, you know, like, I'm just waiting to get kicked off my pedestal here any week. And the other birds help me. Um, so it's going good. The guys, the guys are really feeling good about themselves because they they can see the improvement in their own. Uh, it's good. It's all good. I don't. There's not too much uh, negativity, if any at all, actually. All right. Okay. And Leah, if you have any questions, don't feel shy. Dave, question for you: What's the? What would be your first number one tip? Your first tip. And for anything, for breeding or for racing, or what's the most important thing? Well, the most number one tip, uh, let's start in the stock loft, is acquiring pigeons from an established flyer that has the, that is currently racing uh, with a decent record, okay? Buying pigeons off the internet is okay, but you have to really read the pedigree, look for the performance. And, you know, I bought the pigeons from Feathers Elite from your auction site. And I have every single one. I bought about six or eight. And, and they are breeding well. Um, I choose uh, through the performance and the pedigrees and what I like with eye sign. Right. So the first step is have a decent stock. Now, second point is when you're racing, uh, same thing, same time every day. So you, you've got to have a program that does not vary, if, if possible. I mean, you can put any program together you like that fits your work schedule. Right. Uh, you can train in the afternoon. If that's when you get home, train in the morning before you go to work. But consistency is the name of the game when it comes to racing pitches. That's what fitness responds to. Yeah, and, I, and I've noticed that through all the, the tours I've done in Europe and the United States. Uh, a lot of the top flyers that we visit, the word is consistency and schedule. Uh, they're yeah. very strict on that. Uh, it's almost like the simplest secrets. It's like so simple, it's stupid. <laughs> well, you know, the best kept secret in racing pigeons is there's no secrets. You know, yeah. guys always ask me, what's your secret? What do you, what? There's, there's no secret. The whole secret is good stock. A scheduled training and maintenance program, and that's it. And keep the birds healthy. Uh, do all the vaccinations. They, they are very important these days. Your PMD, uh, your paratyphoid. I haven't done talks in years. It hasn't been an issue. But paratyphoid, PMD, uh, is, is very important. Now, as far as medication is concerned, unless I see a problem, I will. I will not medicate, especially young ones. With it when they come out of the nest in the first eight, 10 weeks, the worst thing that you want to do is put anchor medicine on them, respiratory medicine on them, because that's when they're building their immunities. And if yes. you start putting the meds to them at that young age, you're going to kick the shit out of their immune system, and also the pigeon's immune system will become tolerant to the medication. So when you do have a problem, what will happen is the medication won't work. You'll have to double it up. Yeah. The immune system has strengthened against the man, against the medication they're using. So medications have a place, and, but the place is not on a regular basis. The place is you've got a big problem and you can't knock it out with natural products. Okay, fine. Then you turn to the medicine cabinet and clean it up. Otherwise, try to stay away from it. Okay. That's a, that's a good tip, guys. So don't, now, a uh, question. Uh, before, you know, before, you... before you ask your question, Ryan, I'm just mm -hmm. going to pipe in here. We have a question from Neil Gonzalez, who is tuned in. Neil asks, my understanding was in the past, you used a lot of medication. Your current system now tends to be more natural. Dave, why the change? In the 19, late 80s and the, and the 1990s, colored water, medicated water, was the norm of the day. Everybody did it. And I was the best at it. I used more meds and I tried more stuff. And I used tons of stuff on your and toes. And I flew okay. But guess what? Round about five years, it took about four or five years of that kind of flu. My kidneys were always sick. They were never healthy unless I medicated. I was, I was constantly medicating because I... I have screwed the immune system in my breeders and my racers. 
So I made a conscious decision not to do that anymore. So in 1995, and I went to natural products, and guess what happened? My race results took a dive for two years, right? So it wasn't until 1998 when I weeded out all the weak pigeons with the, immune, with the bad immune systems, and I even had to bring in new blood, right, that hadn't been tainted. And then my winning uh, capabilities uh, started to take over again, and I've never looked back since. And uh, so I, now I'm big on uh, natural products. Uh, do I keep the medication on the shelf? You're damn right I do, because I know if you've got a big outbreak, you've got to hit it with something that works. But I don't use it if I don't have to. And like, say, for example, I keep canker pills, right? And right. if I see a pigeon with a canker problem in the loft, I'm not going to flock treat the whole loft. I'm going to take that pigeon out. I'm going to do it with an individual. Right. And then it comes around or it doesn't. That's the kind of thing I'm into now. No more flock treat. So, again, it's what we're saying. What I hear a lot of is try and use common sense. Hey, if I have a cold in my house, what Dave's really saying is if I have a cold in my house, my mother and sister and father and aunt, we all don't take cold medication if we don't have a cold. So common sense is pull the bird out, treat it individually. You're keeping the immune systems up on the flock and treating that one bird. And it, it gives you an insight on that one bird, right, Dave? On how the pairing exactly. is, if there's problems. So you notice, hey, everything out of that pair of pigeons had a respiratory or some illness, that's... That's a flaw. Exactly. Now, okay, uh, we've all watched you uh, go through a whole round of uh, medication, but you're a different. Uh, you're a different situation. You're running oh. a one loss. So you've got fifty-one different uh, loss and three hundred and fifty-one different uh, bacteria counts. So you uh, you've done the amoxicillin. You've done the. You've done. You've gone through a, a list of things, but that is required in your situation a backyard flyer such as myself and everybody else does not need to do that so that might be confusing to people why is right. Ryan doing right. it right ryan's doing it because he's got 51 loss not just one and that's yeah. the reason why. yeah now a question let's say uh you buy a pigeon off an auction site or a friend sends you a pigeon as a gift and it comes in and it looks like a million dollars. Do you treat it? Do you, what do you do with that one pigeon before you bring it into the flock? Or do you just bring it in and, and see how it fares out? What, what do you do for something like that? Well, um, I, I, I have been bringing in pigeons in the last three years because I sold all my pigeons. And, and so I went around to all my friends in Ontario and, to, and I had a record of people that bought my pigeons. Uh, and I tried to uh, get my birds back, and, and I got quite a bit of my family back, and plus more. Now, I really, I'm really, really careful on who I bring birds in from. Um, so I have I had I had uh, last year I had a little bit of a problem. I brought in some birds back in from a one loft race. Okay, okay. perfectly healthy pigeons, uh, but I had a I had a slight case of streptococcus last year myself. And it was brought in from returning one loft birds. Right. And it's not that the guy did anything wrong that ran the one loft race. Those birds had just picked up that level of bacteria in that environment. And my, and my birds uh, couldn't handle it. So I had some issues. It was sort of the But normally when I bring pigeons in, I'm very fussy on the loft that I bring them in from. I make sure I know the fellow. I know how he handles his pigeons. And if I know he's not a heavy medicator and he has a good result, I'm a little easier on just putting the mood in with the birds. But I have a section that I do put new birds in. Do I medicate them? No, I don't medicate them if they're not sick. I study them and I watch them for about seven to ten days. And if they maintain the level of health and I'm satisfied with, then I'll put them in with the new flock. Um, you know, that's all, it's that kind of thing. It'd be very fussy on where you acquire your birds from. Now, again, uh, I bought the pigeons from Feathers Elite. Every single pigeon I got from Feathers Elite has not given me a single problem. They can hand the blade, the cock bred well, and their young ones are performing for me uh, on the race team. Yeah. So, I mean, you guys do a good job in your 
Well, yeah, we, we, we try our best. And again, even in the quarantines, we don't over medicate. If we see a bird with a respiratory issue or a canker treatment issue, most of the time is what you'll see. We, we isolate and we just treat individually. I find it works the same like you. It works the best. Uh, so yeah, we're on the same page there. Um, question. You talked about streptococcus and you have birds in this one loft race. And I will congratulate you that these birds uh, from so far from start to finish, they've been invincible. Literally, uh, I've never seen a feather out of place on them, which uh, was excellent. But these birds, you know, have gone through it. If these birds do well or you decide to bring them back, so you are not going to be worried at all about bringing them in. You're going to do exactly what you're saying. Step back, take a look at them. You're not afraid. That's correct. I would have no problem bringing them back. Um, I see that you've got the problem cleaned up under control. Uh, before I, I sent out 26 birds to five different one-off races this year. Um, I shot them up with PMD, uh, uh, the chicken vaccine. Okay. Uh, when they come out of the nest, I boosted them four weeks later with the same vaccine. And then I bought vaccine uh, from yourself with the um, PMB1 and the uh, Adeno com yep. combo. So I hit them a third time uh, and then I sent them out to the one loft races. So, and then I, you probably hit them again when they got there. So my pigeons, those four pigeons at your loft probably been done four times. Um, they're also uh, second round uh, babies. So I breed in December. So they hatch in January, so they begin the end of January. So those are like uh, February, early February hatches and weaned uh, at the beginning of March, those four birds at your place. Um, I, I, I breed on the um, natural darkening system. So the lights in the star cooper are for 18 hours. I wean them over the young bird loft on natural daylight. Uh, and it's the hours of the day is like nine and a half hours a day that time of year. So they molt just like junkies. And so my pigeons were already molted on the head and the wings and everything before you got them uh, as well. Which also I find when the pigeons go through that initial mold, the immune system is much stronger as well. But every time you hit them with a vaccine, you're bolstering the immune system on top of that. So maturity level, my birds are very far uh, matured in that respect. And Ooh. as well, um, I let them fly out. Uh, those pigeons were out on the board 10, 12 times, down on the lawn, picking, took a few strings around the lawn, and only one lot did that. And I've, and I've been doing that for years, and I've never had a problem with them being broke either. Right. So you, so you uh, again, when we received your birds, very old. I know people that had seen them, uh, when we had first started doing the shows, they had all made crack jokes. And, oh, his birds are going to piss off the roof. They're going to fly away. You know, and I say, oh, he's, he's had them out 10 or 12 times. Uh, whatever. They've probably gone up, done a couple flies around the loft. They landed. They've been on the lawn. They've, they've done whatever they've done. They're molted good. They were like mature. Uh, they were almost like yearlings when they came. And they haven't made a backward step. And I'll tell you, it's a real eye opener because through start to finish, Dave, your confidence had never changed about them. Oh, I'm not going to no. lose one of them. They're going to be like this. It's almost like you had baked the cake so many times that you knew exactly what was going to happen. And I, and I say to people, and I hope people listen, for every one loft race you send to, take the time, breed them early, get the age on them. Because from transport to us, they had no stress. They went um, into right. the loft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ryan, I'm just going to pipe in here just for a second. We have a question, another question okay. from Neil. And Ryan, I'm just going to ask you to just, I know you're trying to follow the birds in the circle, but just let's keep the camera in one spot because I need a grab all. <laughs> wow, <laughs> thanks, Leo. I, I need a grab all. <laughs> I'm getting uh, seasick watching. Um, okay, so okay. Neil, uh, Neil asks, Neil is asking, uh, can that philosophy apply in uh, one loft races? Most, if not all, use preventative medication. Is there even such a thing? So I don't know if that's a question for you, Ryan, or for you, Dave, or maybe both of you can chime in on that. So what was the question again exactly? I just got, I was trying to sit okay. down and not sit my butt yeah, in the yeah. water. 
Okay. So I guess uh, the philosophy about medicating, can, can that philosophy apply in one loft races? Uh, most, if not all, use preventative medication. Is there even such a thing? So, I mean, I think, Ryan, we, we you are treating them uh, preventatively, right? Like before you see signs of respiratory or whatever, you, you are doing preventative maintenance, right? Treatments. Now, aren't you right? Uh, yeah. I mean, again, with one loft birds, it, it, it's, it's a slight, slightly different because you, the birds come in and you sort of have to treat because you don't know where they're coming from. I mean, you'll see birds that come in uh, with the bands are full of pigeon shit or the tails have pigeon shit on them. They're full of lice or full of mites. You automatically know when you start to see things like that. These are all little red flags. Okay. Right. Uh, and, and that's when you have to start treating. Uh, I don't mind treating the young birds for a canker or a respiratory treatment or coxy treatment one shot before maybe the season starts. I think that's fine. Uh, I think a lot like what Dave says is the more, the more you pump in, the more good you take out. You're better to give them more vitamins, more of the, of, of the positives than the harsh drugs. Because when it's time to use that harsh drug, you want it to work real, real good. You want it to get in there and fire right away. I know lots of people have talked to me about, oh, I've bought birds from a certain guy. Oh, he's the medicator. He medicates, medicates, medicates. And all the birds they get from the guy, they never seem to do anything. It's just like a, it's just a flat line. It's just like, eh, no good. So that's what I've noticed. I don't know. Dave? Yeah, okay. Um, I agree with everything you said. One loft situation is totally different than a backyard plot. One loft, you've got to medicate. Now, Preventative maintenance or preventative medication, those two words make me cringe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there, what are you, okay. Okay. I, I've talked to so many, and I, I was an abuser in the 90s, so I know, I know why they do it because I did it. But what happens is, what are you preventing? If you look at your pigeon and you know well enough, you see no cancer, you see no respiratory, you see no toxin, you see a healthy pigeon. Oh, I'm going to prevent Medicaid for two or three days. What are you preventing? The right. pigeon is healthy. Leave it to freak alone and let it build its immune system. Right. Also, what happens is, and I talk to vets about this. It says on the package, five to seven days, seven to ten days, read the instructions. If you're going to medicate, you use the full treatment and you kick out the poison. What right. happens is when you do these two and three so-called preventative things, you're, 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 you're taking it away from the pigeons in the second or third day just when the medication is starting to kick in. But, and if there is a bug, you fed the bug. You yeah, you, you, yeah. You fed, yeah, you fed the virus or you fed the bacteria you, you think you're trying to kill. And what did you feed it? You fed it medication. Now the next time you go to do that, it's, it's already built an immunity to the medication because you didn't do it full term. So uh, the answer to the question is, I hate preventative medication. I haven't done it since 1995. And since I stopped, I'm better for it. Right. Question for you. Before you start breeding, because you're, uh, you're breeders, do you, you give them uh, any treatments? Because I know I was at your place, your breeders shine, they sparkle. They were sparkling uh, in the springtime there when I was there. Every time I see them on the, on the camera, your birds are sparkling. Uh, if you have a perfect season of breeding, which it sounds like you had an excellent season this year, uh, what will you do in September, October, November to get your breeders ready? Okay. The only thing I do to my breeders once a year, when, when breeders are pumped three, four rounds of babies, right? Mm -hmm. um, with my breeders, when you pick them up after they pump four sets of eight, eight babies, you, they feel like they haven't pumped anything. That's number one. But what happens is constantly feeding babies, scratches in the throat, regurgitation, whatever. I have, and with the heat of the summer in August, I have noticed a little rise in canker. So what I, what I do do is... When I separate all my breeders, I give them around. Uh, I give them seven days of Rizal mm -hmm. to clean up the breeders from from the the, the seasons of pumping younger. 
the next thing I do to my breeders is they all get a PMB shot uh, in the in, uh, middle of November. Okay. And last year, and I'm going to do it this year, I gave them a paratypoid shot as well. So, what do I do? I get canker after I separate them once a year only. That's the only medication my breeders do once a year is canker after breeding and two sets of vaccination. Uh, uh, one for TMB and one for paratypoid in November, prior to meeting in December. That's it. Oh, now, oh. Okay, go ahead. No, no, good. Keep going. You're on. You're on okay. fire now. <laughs> All right. So the other thing that I've been practicing for the last year and a half is apple cider vinegar, and that's the cold pressed vin apple cider vinegar uh, from the health food store. Or you can buy it. Uh, you can buy it at Sobeys too. It says cold pressed, not the not the uh, the other stuff. That and Primalac from the Canadian Racing Pigeon Union. Mm -hmm. I go, you know, the big tub from the Canadian Basin Racing Pigeon Union, that's 80 or 100 bucks or something, right? And they have a small, I buy, I go through about four of those a year. Every day I put two, I got a three gallon pail of water. I tip the jug, one, two, like two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar to three gallons of water. And then I put one tablespoon of Primalac in there. All my pigeons on the property got that every single day. Like I'm talking 365 days a year, and that keeps the pH balance uh, uh, to the level of health in the pigeon, and also the uh, the primalac keeps the gut bacteria at a, at a level. Therefore, my birds have the to fight off any any uh, anything that can get into them, and that that's all I do with the breeders. Okay, now here's a question for a new guy. Uh, you're I've, I've listened to you, Dave. Sorry about that. I had a mosquito eat me. I'm listening to you, Dave. I've gone on to the apple cider vinegar, the Primalac. I'm using it every day. I'm using it every day. Oh, boy. I've got a huge respiratory issue or a huge canker issue. Do I take them off the Primalac, off the apple cider vinegar when I when I put the Ridzol or whatever I'm using for respiratory into the water? You take it right off of that. Correct. So don't mix them all together. No. Don't make a concoction. No. If you make a concoction, the uh, yeah, they'll conflict with one another. So... Uh, if you do have to use respiratory or you do have to use Ritzol, then I skip the Primalac and the apple cider. Right. So you'll just go straight with that and that's it. So, that, I mean, that's a question you get people ask all the time. Uh, can I mix them up? Stuff like that. Just a note, guys, birds are flying pretty good this morning. The odd one's coming down. Uh, they've been on the wing about 34 minutes. So that's good. Leah, you have any questions? Uh, any questions? Let me just take a look here at the board. We've got Philippe de Kuna says, good morning. Uh, Troy says, if it's not broken, don't fix it. We've got uh, Paul Fairweather in the house from Australia. Uh, no other questions that I can see. But hey, folks, if you do have questions for Dave Ottaway or for Ryan, please post them in the comments below. I am monitoring uh, the questions, and I will fire away. Go ahead, Ryan. Now, now Dave, um, in in your... When you're flying, and I now know where you guys fly a, a, a old and, and young together, but when you were in your heyday here in, in the, the, the Toronto area, the Up North Combine, did you prefer old birds, young birds? Uh, did you use certain types of systems uh, with old or young, or, or what did you prefer? Okay. Um, number one, in the, when I was flying in the Up North Combine uh, in the good old days, uh, when we had 140 uh, flyers, and uh, a ton of members, like 200. Uh, I used to, uh, an old bird was my specialty. I hate young birds because they're looks for a lot of work. The last eight years before I came out to Nova Scotia, I did not race young birds. Uh, I merely trained them out to uh, 50, 80 miles, had five or six group tosses with everybody that I could get my hands on. Uh, season them a bit and then I started them fresh as yearlings and just like the birds uh, the first two weeks they had to learn and then after that they started banging in dropping combines doing whatever they, they did on the, on the, at, the, at the moment now I had years before that I used to buy old young birds I do the whole gauntlet um, at one point uh, I was uh, three years in a row I was uh, Champion loss in young birds, old birds, average speed, 
uh, long and short, uh, young and old birds combined. I did that three years in a row on the upmark combine. Uh, and the only guy that ever uh, beat that was uh, Mr. Alvis. Uh, after I left in 1990, he came in, or no, 2000, uh, Tony came in and he had a five year run uh, where he did the exact same thing. So, uh, Focal Vale was another hot, hot flyer. Uh, Bob Moody was very consistent. George Roof and that. All these old names, uh, you know, that's when pigeon flying was really, really tough. We, we had about 15 old bird flyers that could knock you off with, with pedestal at any time. And young bird flyers, there was about 20, 25 that could get in there and knock you down with a second. So, um, system. Uh, I used to fly a team of double widowhood in old birds. Plus, I had another loft where I kept about 15 pair of natural pigeons. So what I used to do was uh, start them all off the first race. I had my team of widows and, and my natural team. So uh, the natural team, of course, you can't get as many races out of it because you got to set them up and all that. So the widow, double widowhoods would take over. Then after about seven weeks, the widowhood pigeons would actually uh, get a little bit stale on me. So by that time, I'd have the, uh, the mattress that lost with the 10 or 15 pair of uh, nest pigeons. They would basically take up the slack, and I'd let the widowhood pigeons tear up and go on nest to rejuvenate them because they go stale on the system after a while. Well, my God, as soon as those double widowhood pigeons lay that first set of eggs, they would set the combine on fire for about four weeks, uh, and, then, and then they're gone. They're going like crazy. Now, Focal Vale, uh, Warner's father, uh, he had a, his system was very much the same, uh, double widowhood, and then put them on nest for the long races. But me and a couple of other guys learned every every year, two, seasons, two weeks of, of every season, Focal would take a, take it down. Take a, yeah, take he a would. And you know why? Because he was setting up his widowhoods on eggs, and the cocks were driving, and the hens were on eggs, and that's when he was vulnerable. So what I did was I had a lot of naturals and a lot of double widowhoods. I wouldn't take that two week drop. <laughs> so <laughs> you're waiting for the drop. Okay. Uh, a, a question. <laughs> someone had texted me in uh, on the, on the texting line. You flew in the up North. Uh, they fly an old bird series and they flew a young bird series and it starts in May and it goes to September and it's just pigeons from, Basically, it's pigeons from start to finish. As soon as the snow melts, it's pigeons until the leaves blow off the trees and it's shit again. Uh, you, you packed it in here when you moved out to Nova Scotia, and then you got that itchy little bug, and you want to get back into it. And you started this, this combine thing out in Nova Scotia that you have built slowly with your, your guys, bringing them in. And you've adopted, I think, a fantastic, it's a hybrid combine flying. And I want to ask you, uh, how it works, because you mix young and old, um, because that's really, I think, where the future could be going. And again, to keep this sport promoting and building with new people, young people, we can't take people's whole summers. We can't. And I think this style of what you, I don't, maybe you didn't come up with it, you learned it from somebody, but you you tried it. You're an older gentleman, you you flew the reg, the, the, the regimental whole summer style, and you've tried this out. You've changed it. Explain to the people what the system is and how do you like it since you've been doing it? We love it. And like my guys out here, uh, what when I got here, they hadn't flown old birds in four or five years because uh, of the expense and the time frame that you talked about. And uh, the few of them said, well, we'd like to fly old birds, but, you know, we just, uh, you know, because we do our own driving out here. We're a smaller group. We, we don't have a paid driver. There's four of us that take turns driving and the gas is covered. So anyways, in Europe, you know, I've watched lots of videos and I do a lot of studying on the internet and, you know, they fly old and young for, for since, you know, Christ was a child. So I thought to myself, you know what, why don't we get that going here? So I said to the guys, okay, I want to fly old birds. And you, some of you want to fly old birds. Uh, we're a smaller group. We can't afford the seasons of trailer fees. Uh, and all that time. So let's fly old and young birds together. 
and I'm, I'm the race secretary, so I just separate the old numbers on the race sheet on the Winsby program when I do the data entry and, and, uh, and Bob's your uncle. Now, how do you do it? Okay, the whole secret of it is the cult that you breed in December. All right, so you can breed later and put them on the dark system, and the numbers will be ready. We start June 27th, and we fly 11 weeks. So we're finishing up the first week of September. The whole secret with the old bird is the wing molt. How do you stop the wing molt? Okay. Don't mate your old bird team up till eight weeks before the first race. So we start at the end of June. So June, okay, uh, May, June. So I do not mate my old birds up. We set them up for widowhood until May the 1st. Okay. Because what makes old birds molt on the wing is when the hen lays that second round of eggs, it automatically uh, mobilizes the wing molt. We need the second egg to drop within a week the first flight goes. So, not, so first thing is, don't make your old birds until eight weeks before the first scheduled combination lays. Second thing is, don't let the hens lay the second round of eggs. Okay? Separate them and put them on widowhood. So you'll let the, sorry to cut you off. So you'll let the yeah. race birds, <clears throat> you'll put them together, the race team, May the 1st. Uh, you'll let them drop a round of eggs. Will you let them hatch and raise or will you just let them drop them, sit, pull? What do you do? Just just, just let them do the whole thing? You you can do it both ways. You can let them drop the eggs and sit uh, and then, and then uh, put dummies under them so they don't hatch. Or you can let them hatch one and uh, just one for nest and then, uh, when the young when the young one's about uh, 10 12 days old you move it under a pair of stock birds and then and then you separate okay so that's the secret you breed them early you put your race team together eight weeks before the first basically combine results or before the first combine race um, and then uh, you breed early so the babies got the age now uh, how did you, when you went on to this, how did you find it work? Because you had a small club and combine here where you are. So the guys picked it up a lot easier than we're like, say where we are, where you're kind of knocking your head against the wall because people don't want to change. Right. See out, out here, everybody, uh, we, because we don't have the luxury of 80 flyers or whatever, everybody realizes that you have to give and you have, take if you want to survive and if we want to race so uh when i said to the guys okay I, I, out here the cost of living is very cheap but there's a reason for it because the average wage is a lot lower than ontario so financing uh the hobby is, is an issue so i said okay so here's what we're going to do we're going to make 11 races uh we're going to figure out the gas money for each race so our race schedule costs about 2600 dollars to do uh, 11 weeks which is 22 races, 11 young and 11 old. Okay, so we pay 100 bucks for the first four races, then we dump at 50 bucks, another 50, another 50, another 50, till we get to the long race, for the, which pays 500 to the guy that's driving the birds. Now, so divide that by the number of people racing. So, so far, we haven't paid more than 350 a season for like 22 races, once a year. Now, okay, so you breed your pigeons, you start training four weeks before, so you're training uh, the end of May, first of June, and you're done by the end of August. Uh, so time frame is shorter. The the monetary cost for trailer fees is shorter, and you get old and young birds in at the same time. Now I want to talk about the wing molt on the old birds. Now right now, okay, so I've done yeah, I've made my old birds up eight weeks before the first race. I did this last year and the year before as well. Uh, right now, my old birds just kicked the first flight, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and yep. uh, we've flown, we flown three weeks. So we've got eight weeks left, and they're on their first flight. Now, I've also turned the lights on uh, with uh, my natural darkening system. I think even dark guys can do it anyway on the full system. You turn your lights on. I turn them on for 18 hours, June 21st, because that's the longest day of the year. And what what the most is the days get shorter. So Mother Nature says, days are getting shorter, you better change the feathers. So you don't let the days get shorter. You turn the lights on on the timer switch. I have them come on at 5 in the morning, go off at 8 at morning, have them come back on at 7 at night, and go back on, off at 11 p.m. So my birds 
get to 18 hours of light a day and six hours darkness. By doing that, that's more for, for darkening, but also it works on the old birds. Now my old birds are starting to kick, but they're on the 18 hours light as well. So it will, it will, it will not stop their mold, but it will retard the mold. And I, when we finished the last race of the year last year, my old birds were no further up than the third. A couple of them were on the fourth uh, because they had, you know, faster body metabolisms. But they never got past the fourth flight, which is absolutely fine. Well, wow, so the wings were nice and pretty much nice and full the whole way. Uh, we also had a viewer. Uh, we had a question, right, Leah? Uh, yeah, we have a question from Neil, and he's asking for fanciers only flying one loft races. What ways can you become more competitive? The first hurdle seems to be getting a bird to the final. Great question, Neil. Do you want me to answer that? Go ahead, Dave. You answer yeah. first. <laughs> you answer first, and then Ryan will answer. <laughs> well, you know, in my experience, Neil, is having a loft of pigeons with a strong immune system, which means get rid of the flock uh, medication. Okay. So, first of all, good pigeons. Strong immune system. Do your vaccinations at least three times before you send them out. Um, uh, also, the quickest way to be a successful uh, one loft flyer, if you're doing all that, spend lots of money. Send out 20, 20 30 one loft pigeons to five different one loft races every year for five years. You're going to come out with a family of pigeons. Number one, that have strong immune systems. Number two, are bred for one loft racing, even though I feel there's no difference between a good combine pigeon and a one loft pigeon. If they fly good in the combine, they'll fly good in one loft. So a good pigeon is a good pigeon is a good pigeon, whether you one loft it or not. Now, it's just like when the importers uh, brought pigeons over from Belgium, everything was a pure strain. Bullshit. All the all, all the all the master breeders in, in Belgium of the day in the 50s and 60s and 70s, they crossed all their pigeons. They swapped pigeons back and forth. There was no pure strains. But the salespeople used the word pure Jansen, pure this, pure that, to, to merely sell pigeons. What's the new term now? Bread for one loft racing. Pure one loft family. Bullshit. My combine pigeons have found, done very well on one loft racing as well on the up north combine there's a there's a, a i don't want to mention names because i don't want to take away anybody's thunder but there's a couple of people around that have got my pigeons uh, my black pigeons and a couple of my other birds uh from me and they sent them to one loft races and they've won money with them right combine pigeons winning money in one loft racing okay so don't be fooled by pure one loft family bullshit it's just like a pure pedigree same thing okay i i, I agree uh 150 percent uh what dave's saying good pigeons are good pigeons again uh you know what you fly those one loft races you, you you do like dave says and you send out to five or six or two or three or one or two whatever and a pigeon makes it through the whole series and maybe it's not uh, a top pigeon it's a consistent pigeon it's you know it finishes 20th in the average speed bring that pigeon back take a look at it because it has uh, it has something in it. It's it's dealt with a big group of pigeons. It, it it's it's mastered the health. It's gone through the loft flying, the breaking, the one loft system. You can always bring that in, bring it back, try it out, breed out of it. You may be surprised. And what you want to do is breed that bird. I say up again. What Dave was saying is combine pigeons are, do the same as one loft pigeons. I agree a hundred percent. I look at pigeon flyers. I'll use Gallo Loft in Spring Hill, Florida. He dominates in the combines there. He goes out to one loft races in Africa all over, right at the top, same pigeons. Then you look at Baldwin and Tilson. Okay, Baldwin and Tilson, they only fly one loft races. But you'll right. see he sends birds to guys to fly in concourses, and he'll post at certain times of the year, oh, Jerry Smith topped the combine with those birds. Um, there's no such thing as the one loft. It's good pigeons. You need good pigeons. Right. You need that immunity. And I think, Dave, you hit it right on the head. But you have to you have to be able to be willing to test, too. If you don't test, you know, you're not going to know. It costs money to fly pigeons and, and win. It costs money to fly one-loft racing. It's a, it's, a, it's a money racket. 
Now, with the exception, you're, 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 what you're doing there is a breath of fresh air. Um, but all the rest of them, it's strictly a money game. So the more money you have, the more pigeons you send out. If you're not flying in a club or combine, the only place you can test is at the one lot. Well, guess what? That's an expensive way of finding your good pigeons. But if you race in club and combine at the same time, your best pigeons on your club and combine are the ones you send to the one lot. They're going to do just as well. And, uh, and we don't even have to go far out of Canada. Uh, somebody that's better at it than I am, because I, I personally, myself, I hate gambling. I'm not a gambler, but okay. I'll throw, I'll throw the dice once or twice and, 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 uh, and I'll try, I'll send out a team. You know, I ain't going to send out 20 birds to one lot, just one lot. You know, I, I don't believe in spending money on gambling. I got a thing about that. So that's why you, you don't see me a lot in one loss, but I do go to a few, but Guido Madrizzi. There's a prime example of a guy who's a master uh, judge in fancy pigeons. He's also a master racing pigeon man and breeder of pigeons. Now, that guy came into the one loss scene uh, 10 years ago or whenever he started racing and dominated right away. But he also cleans up in his combine with the same pigeons. So uh, there you go. Right in southern Ontario, you've got a guy that shows it. There's another guy not far from you, Ryan, uh, that does same thing. He, he flies very well in club and combine, and he's been scoring at the one lot races also. Um, so it's good pigeons. A strong immune system, and, and that's it. You know, I've been to, to California, and I've talked to gentlemen uh, in the U.S. Some spots are very spread out, and guys have literally, sorry, I'm walking around here, have nobody to fly against, and they're top one lot guys, and I ask them, well, what do you do? And they say, well, we breed around the pigeons and we law fly them. We'll emu emulate or we'll, we'll make a new year. Every year is a new year is how we fly our own birds in our own loft. We only fly the birds to our loft. We do different tests. We law fly them once a day. We feed them corn and barley or we, we, do, we give them no medication and we give them six tosses and they just go bang, 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 jumping all the way out. And they go right out to 300 miles and they do different tests with the birds Birds just coming back to their loft if they can't fly in a combine because they say you always have to be testing. And you know what? Just taking them yourself. If you say, hey, I'm not going to fly young birds this year. I'm not going to fly old birds. Hell with it. But I want to start flying and keep flying one lofts. I suggest that you raise a round of youngsters that you can go down the road with, play with, punish, train, do some different stuff to find still your good birds in your loft. I, I agree with you 100%. When, when, I, when I was in the up north the last eight years, I quit flying young birds, but it, didn't, uh, it doesn't mean I didn't train them. I, I worked those pigeons right out to sometimes 100 miles, 30, 35, 40 tosses on those young birds. Never seen a race, but they were worked. Did I have some bad tosses? Darn right I did. Did I get rid of the dummies? Darn right I did. And that's the same thing uh, that I'm doing right now. Um, you uh, you've invited me to have Austin. Uh, I've bred, I've got 37 young birds in uh, late bred Austin birds. I call them late bred Austin birds. Have you seen them on my video? Those pigeons will be trained right out to 60 miles. I'm going to put up a 35, 40 passes on them while I'm training my other one. And I'll get rid of the dummies and the pigeons that I present at Feathers Elite Austin this year. Those pigeons will have been trained. The dummies will be gone. And you can, and then, you know, rest assured, the guys, uh, if they buy, uh, they've got a pigeon that at least has been worked out, and we know it's just something between years. Super. Now, uh, I think we have another viewer's question. Leah, go ahead and fire it in. We have another question from Neil. Neil, great participation in this chat. Uh, he's asking, Dave, what are your thoughts on the following? Drag, loft location, wind. How much of an influence, if any, does this have in combine results? Okay. If you've got a group of people like Unit 10 down in Florida that are all close together, uh, loft location and wind really doesn't mean all that much. If you're in a combine with a 40-mile front and 50 miles deep, when does play a factor in the races? Um, my good friend Mike Vanderjack and I have agreed to disagree on, on the wind factor, but we do agree on one thing about wind. If it's a tailwind, 
it favors the long end. If there's like, say the, say the combine is 50 miles deep. So the guy at the short end clocks his pigeon, say with a, with a 10 kilometer tailwind. As the day progresses, the, uh, it, it, the wind picks up three or four kilometers on the ass between the first loft and the last loft. The last loft's going to have a higher velocity because he's picked up two kilometers of push on his ass. But the reverse happens in headwind. The first guy clocks. Now the, the bird, now this other guy, 50 miles down the road, the wind picks up two kilometers on the nose. So now it slows him down by two clicks. So the short end guy is going to win because the long end guy's bird's been slowed down by, by, by the headwind. So it speeds him up if he's got a tailwind, slows him down with a headwind. Mike and I agree on that. Mike and I disagree with sidewinds. Okay, Mike says a good pigeon will cut into it, and the pigeon doesn't know if there's a if there's a wind on its side or not. It will still fly into it. Okay, so what has my experience been flying with the combine? I've always I used to fly in the center of the combine, so I didn't care where the wind came from because I was down the bowling alley. And then the last 20 years, I raised pigeons in the upper combine. It was always on the west side of the combine uh, with prevailing northwest winds. Well, guess what? A strong west, anything over 10 clicks from the west, uh, I couldn't get a top result. The guys on the east would always, would always get me. But there's always that pigeon that will clock, right? So but one clock bird clocking does, does not make, make the, the, the result. So, you know, but if one did it, why didn't they also? Because the wind, I feel the wind has an effect. So loft position does have a, have a, have a, a big uh, factor uh, in combine. Um, now, what I've learned out here in Nova Scotia, we can't fly up the province here this year, so we're flying up in the Cape. Right? Until uh, before that, we were flying into New Brunswick and into Quebec. They were up to the St. Lawrence River. And I fly, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the furthest loft on the west with the west, prevailing west winds again, just like Ontario. Everybody is on the east. When the wind blows out of the west, those guys on the east have the advantage on them. Um, I thought my birds had to have to jump 30 to 50 miles of water to get a so sometimes I'd be an hour and a half behind. Why? Because the wind was too strong out of the west. It blew my birds east, and they did, and they didn't jump the water. Now this year, we are flying out of Cape Breton, and everybody's pretty much in a straight line with one another, and still the long walk. But I don't have 50 miles of water to jump, and if it's a headwind, we all got the headwind, not just me. See, the other way, those guys had a side tailwind, but my birds were flying a headwind. So yes, the wind does have a factor. And this year I'm very competitive because now I'm on a straight line with, the, with everybody. And there's four or five of us here that are all within a minute and seconds apart. It's, it's excellent. I mean, at any moment here, you know, I'm going, I'm going for a crapper. One of these guys is going to knock me off, knock me off, which is fine because, uh, you know, it's, it's good competition. Yeah, I'd have to agree with Dave. Uh, and again, uh, Dave mentioned a, a top flyer, I guess, in the early 80s and 90s, uh, Volker and Warner Vale. And Volker's always, the one thing he said was, it was very subtle, but you can only win what your competition will allow you. And uh, and I think that's what you're saying. I agree. If, if the winds are, are with you, you're going to do better. If the winds are against you, Hey, you know what? It, it is. It, it's going to be a hell of a lot tougher. Um, all those points are good. I know, Leah, you had another viewer's question, and uh, you're seeing the birds out here on the lawn after their loft fly. They're getting into the weed plant, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, not so much question, but just some comments. We've got uh, Dan Gregoric. He says, "Bravo, guys! I've been doing the same for years. All of my young birds go to 400 miles every year. I find my best breeders that way to fly them hard." Uh, Brad says he only does one loft races, and he has found when he brings them back uh, and found out they breed well and they are tough birds. Do you agree, Dave? Yes, I, I agree 100%. Um, Dan and, and Brad, uh, if you're not flying, I know Dan does it. Uh, if you're not flying uh, club and combine because there's there's just not enough in your area or whatever, uh, 
you're developing a super pigeon through the test. The test area is the one lock race. If you're flying club and combine, the test area is club and combine or both. So are you going to find a good pigeon uh, flying one lock? You're damn right you will. Are you going to find a good pigeon flying? You're damn right you will with club and combine. What I look for in, in, in the one lock racing scenario is the pigeons that compete for average speed in the one loft races, those are your good pigeons because they're showing you week in and week out, they're maintaining a level of performance. The one shot wonder that comes out of nowhere and wins in a one loft race, I, I, I'm not interested in that pigeon. I, I'd be more interested in fifth average speed from one to 10 in a one loft race, from first to 10th average speed, individual bird in one, those are the birds that I'm interested in so because they're showing you over a period of four or five uh, preliminary races that they can fly and, and maintain. That's no difference than flying five or six races in a combine. So, yes, I, you can find good pigeons in one lot, but I pick the average speed pigeons, not necessarily the one. I totally agree with Dave. I will totally uh, – Dave goes looking at one to ten. Guys, if you finish a one loft race and you're new into this and you're trying to build a one loft family, you got a bird that finishes in the 20th, and you've, you've looked at how it's performed through all the training, the group tosses, and the bird is there. It's a consistent pigeon. Uh, bring it back. Try it out. You're going to find good luck from it. But look for those average speed pigeons. If you buy the one and done pigeons, uh, I, again, I think you're just uh, putting a, a shot to the dark. I've noticed every time I've brought birds back that are top average birds, they automatically seem to breed good right away. Um, that's just what I've noticed. I think Dave said the same thing. And same with your average speed pigeons in your combine. I think those are pigeons that they're, they're the meat and the potatoes. They're the ones that you're counting on every week and then you have a name for them and they just, they keep coming. And those are the ones that you, you build it around. Yeah, it's not that much different, as you say. And, uh, average speed pigeons on a combine, same thing as average speed pigeon in a one loft race. It's, they're, they're building their reputation over a period of four or five races. Uh, now, if you get a combine pigeon that wins two or three combines, okay, maybe he's not that good in the average speed because he had a few bad races, but he scored three combines. Okay, I take that one now. You yeah. know, there's well, I think I think what you're saying is there's an exception to every rule, and guys, mm -hmm. you have to be able to be flexible. The thing with pigeon flying is you got to be flexible. These pigeons here that you see on the lawn, I've overfed them. I had to give them more feed yesterday. I want them to come back up, build up a bit. We got to make some exceptions to some rules at times. And it's the same thing with picking stock birds or sending birds out. Uh, you you got to make some exceptions. If you've never tried sending old pigeons out, try it. I, I highly recommend it. I think the way Dave sent his pigeons to our race, and I know he sent this to some other races, though his results were very high on the old birds, uh, almost, I would say, bulletproof. Yeah. And, and what you're doing here today, I mean, yeah, okay, you, you, you had to feed a little more. But why? Because the birds sat, they were six or seven hours past their feed. You, some of the, you had some eight or six or eight birds there that came a little later from the toss that needed uh, more food to build. So big deal. The one lot pigeons we're looking at right now on the screen, they didn't come in today. Big freaking deal. That's just part of the game. You, and, and, that, and that's the mark of a good handler. You knew they needed more feed. But, and you were willing to sacrifice a faster trap today to give them more feed to have them there to fly in the future. So that was a good call. You give them more food because you seen they needed it. You observed. You're observing. And you're doing a very, very good job there. With those kids. Uh, I, 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 you know, I'm very impressed with the way you and your dad and, and Leah are, are running this thing. And uh, it's, 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 you're, you're one of a kind. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Oh, well, we are we are we are one of a Enough. kind. Yeah, well, yeah, you're one of a kind. Right? <laughs> um, I'm just the... gonna I'm just gonna pop in here just for a quick sec. We do have uh, some more viewer comments and a couple questions. Um, so Neil again is asking, so no such thing as drag. Uh, and then Troy says, uh, one lap races need to have more races, in his opinion. And we have Kelly Stone in the house, and she says, good morning. We were discussing training from other directions. At what point in the training mileage would you switch 
directions. Okay. Training, I don't quite understand. Uh, uh, train uh, and uh, switch well, direction. Well, direction for what? Well, well Dave, uh, Dave, let's, let's, maybe this will help the question. Let's take a look at a Calgary Combine. 30 members oh. or 40 members, and they fly every week around the clock. One week they go north 100 miles. The next week they go south 200 miles. The next week they go east 250 miles. The next week they go west 240 miles. They go around the clock. Now, uh, can you train your pigeons around the clock, and how would you do it? Okay. In that scenario, I mean, that, that it's common sense. If you're going to race around the clock, then you train around the clock. So – you train your pigeons 10 miles north, day two, 10 miles south, 10 miles west, 10 miles south, 10 miles east, 20 miles. Okay, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. You train in a circle around the clock as, as the same way that they race around the clock until you get out 30, 40, 50 miles to the west, to the north, to the south, to the east. Okay, now your pigeons have homed in from the four different directions during your training program. Now they're ready for racing from any direction because they're used to it. Right. And, and I, I think what Dave's saying is start them slow, a few kilometers each direction, move them up in increments that you're comfortable with and how you feel. If it's five yeah. kilometers, move them up five or three miles, move up three miles, five miles, whatever you want to do, move them around the clock. But remember, if you're getting pigeons, I do think this as well. If you've got a pigeons from a guy who's a top flyer that's flying a north course or a south course, whatever course, and he's been at the top of his game for a long time, and he pounds them on a system, those birds, when you bring them to your loft and breed out of them, they may not uh, – does that make sense, Dave, what I'm trying to say? They may not uh, pick up the system as good as, unless you're buying from a guy like, like Wayne Bodwine. I'm using use Wayne. That's flying this around the clock system all the time. I, I agree. I mean, uh, if you're if you're a new flyer and your and your race course is predominantly a headwind course, where do you go get pigeons from a guy that flies a headwind course, not a guy that flies a tailwind course? Because that man that flies a tailwind course has cultivated a family of very fast pigeons, right? Unless he's smart enough to keep a few pairs of headwind pigeons in the background for when the wind goes the other way. But if you fly a headwind course, you buy headwind pigeons from a fancier that has a good record that flies a headwind course. You get his results out, you study it's his geographic, and you try to match it to your own. And if you fly a tailwind course, then you go buy tailwind pigeons from a guy that flies good on a tailwind course. If you fly a course like the up north combine, where you get a, a side wind one week, a north wind the next week, and a headwind the other week, then you best keep a variety you better keep uh, like four pairs of headwind pigeons, four pairs of feeders, you know, four pairs of middle distance, and, and mix it up, right? And, right. And that's basically what you have to do. So you buy according to what your your uh, race course uh, demands uh, from a similar flock that has the same situation. Right. And, and again, I think what Dave's saying is again, use your common sense. Right. If you love grizzles and you want to fly, uh, you know, a tailwind course and all you find are headwind grizzles, I wouldn't go out and buy those and say we're going to reinvent the wheel. I'd go out and say, hey, I'm not going to buy those headwind grizzles. I'm going to take my time and hunt for tailwind grizzles. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Common so, sense. We, we have another um, question from our audience. Neil is asking, how do you grade a pigeon? Are personality oh. traits more important than physical traits? Great question. Ooh, Dave, go on, okay. Mr. Grader. <laughs> I, uh, all of the above, Neil. I mean, um, first, the first thing I do is I have a criteria of how I like a pigeon to be. My fingertip says, you know, good length to the keel, not a short keel, not a deep keel, medium to, you know, shallow keel. You know, I like a tail that points out or to the ground. I like, uh, you know, for a speed pigeon, you know, I like a different type of wing than I would like for a long distance pigeon. So, I mean, um, character. The pigeons with the best character, the ones that you can fight with and play with on the box and they become your pals that are very calm demeanor, those pigeons do very well in long distance racing because they're sensible. 
the wall banger and the pigeons that just don't want to get along with you and don't like being handled, those are your middle, your sprint to middle distance pigeons that are, that are, that are hyper and, and wound tight. And they'll fly very quickly. But the, the ones that fly very, very, uh, the ones that are very calm in the loft, I find, especially in the oldest thing, those are your longer distance pigeons. So when I pair them up, I pair by type. And I use the pedigree for performance. I mean, you got to have performance. I mean, you know, you'll notice in my pedigrees, uh, when you read them, if both parents don't have performance, one side will certainly have, one side will have the performance and the other side uh, will be breeding performance or racing performance. And that's what I try to do. I try to, I, I get the paper out and I'm not looking at the string. I don't give a damn about the string because there is no such thing as string. I grade them by short, middle, middle, and long distance pigeons. And they all have a different body uh, confirmation and a different confirmation. So once you learn how to check out a long distance pigeon or the trade of 50 pigeons, a middle distance and a speed pigeon, then you make them accordingly. Now, what happens is if your long distance pigeons get too slow, then you pop in a middle distance speed bird into the, into the mix. To, to pump them up a little bit, right? And then, let's say, say, let's say you breed a good round of babies, right? You've crossed the middle distance curve with a long distance curve, and you've got some good pigeons. Now you want to take those good pigeons that won those races, that those that hybrid cross. How do you mate it? I take a look at the confirmation and the build of the, of the pigeon in question, and, I, and whatever family trait that leads toward by visual and physical feel, I made back to that family. If it, if it goes straight to the middle distance side, I'll make it back to the middle distance side. If it goes straight to the long distance half of the pedigree, I'll make that make it back that way. And this is called blind breeding, right? Blind breeding for physical traits and performance. Not blind breeding because that's my uncle and that's my niece, okay? It's all based in my loss on performance and the way the pigeon feels. I think that, that that's that's perfectly well said. Uh, I yeah I, I agree. I think uh, the the way Dave breeds the pigeons, uh, he breeds them to the type that that he likes. And, and again, um, you got to have pigeons that you like in your loft that you enjoy. You know, if you don't like a big deep handling pigeon, it's not your cup of tea. You know, don't have those in your loft. Don't go out and acquire those pigeons. Acquire what you like, what you're looking for. I know, Dave, you're big into eye sign as well. Some people say eye sign's hogwash, but I think when you look at certain points, you're looking at buoyancy, balance, the, the, the arm, the wing, the, the feather quality, the eye sign, you want to put as many check, uh, check marks into that box. And again, all the, the good looks are great, but if it's just good looks and everything says bread for stock, 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 you know what you're going to get? You're going to get a good looking bread for stock racing pigeon. And the odds of it firing, that's it. <laughs> the odds yeah. of it firing aren't very high. Yeah, you've got to have perform. I, 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 I'll go as far back as the grandparents to look for the either the breeding performance, like bread breadwinners or is the winner. I would like to see at least one grandparent top and bottom of the parent of the pedigree that shows breeding performance or racing performance or both right I don't care about great grandparents I, I, I go far uh, I'll, I'll buy a grandchild uh, with a pedigree that has two grandparents that were super racers or super breeders I'll put the chance on that and chances are I'll, you know, I, I could come up like a kid but um, Performance is the key. Right. Um, and, and, yeah. and and not to cut you out, Dave, I know we have a viewer's uh, question, but I'm going to bet you when you bring in a pigeon that has it only on the grandparent side, when you're breeding that to a pigeon in your loft, you're going to breed it to something that's raced, raced quite well or been a very consistent racing bird and in that pedigree racing all the way through it. Is that correct? Yeah. That's gonna, correct. You're going to breed it up. Now, one thing I've noticed over the years, uh, in competitive flying, the Upmore Combine is a lot. I would say 70%, maybe 60% of my best racers uh, didn't breed a thing in the stock loft. I ended up putting them back out on the race team. And, and you know, uh, for some reason, some pigeons just can't reproduce their qualities. 
But then I stumbled across uh, a, a couple of times. I bred from the racer that raced really well, won a couple of combines or whatever. Uh, his young ones didn't fly with a crap. But then I bred from those young ones, and they bred winners. They passed so it basically, on. it skipped the generation uh, uh, to, to get to the back to the racers. So there's no surefire formula. It's right. kind of trial and error. And eventually, you'll know all the pig, all the cockbirds off this cock race well, but they don't breed well. But those, but the grandchildren breed well. I mean, those are the things you'll learn about your pigeons over time. Right. Leah, you, I think we had a viewer's question. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I uh, just want to say good morning to Carlos. He gave us all a good morning. Uh, Kelly Stone is asking, and how do you decide local talent breeding stock without pedigree when you breed it in? Well, look at the kids coming to the front yard. <laughs> uh, Kelly, uh, the answer to that question is, I don't normally buy the flower local stock because I want to. I want something different. I want something from the outside. If I if I go locally, like if I'm starting out brand new, locally is where you go, right? But once once you get seasoned, you don't want the same caliber of pigeon as your competition, or you'll never be as good as that person is, right? So you go outside your area and you bring in different pigeons, and uh, if it's got no pedigree, uh, I probably wouldn't touch it unless the guy shows me the bird had won umpteen different races, but I don't have a pedigree. And I pick the pigeon up, it's in my hand. I look at the pigeon, I feel it with my fingers. I look at the eyes, I look at the body and the confirmation and the muscle. Plus it's got a race record. Hey, I'll give it a shot. I'll start the pedigree from, from that pigeon then, right? But basically I don't touch pigeons without breeding or racing records uh that's i just don't do it. I, I i i'm very fussy i try to keep a very high standard uh of criteria in my breeding loft because whatever the criteria is in my breeding loft is going to reflect on my racing are we all still there ryan you're still there everybody's still there i'm here can you hear me okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Ryan, just making sure you're still there. I don't know. He might have went to the bathroom. <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, we've yeah. got uh, Scott. He says, good morning, guys. Uh, let's see if we have any other comments here. I'm not sure where Ryan's gone. He might have went in the house, but uh, oh, no, he's left the room. So it's just yet. Yeah. Oh, now he's reconnecting. It's you and me here, Dave. Um, so just going to ask you a question. For new people starting out, what would be your top three tips for new people just starting out number one thing that i see new people do that that is wrong and they, they don't it's not wrong it's a mistake is they build a pigeon lock first without going out and looking at a successful pigeon lock the ventilation is all wrong the setup is all wrong um that's the first mistake they make they need to go to an experienced flyer uh, that has uh, a good race record and look at his loft and, and see why his loft is, is good for racing and, and copy it. Okay, that's the first mistake they make. The second mistake they make is, and it's not really a mistake, uh, they don't know which pigeons to buy. Everybody in the club wants, wants a new member, so everybody floods them with pigeons. And those are great. Starter pigeons are, are the best pigeons to learn with. They're free. Um, most people will give you a half decent one, but they won't give you your best one, but that's okay. They're starter pigeons. And then after a year or two, when, when you learn a little bit more, uh, you've built the proper loft, you've got your starter pigeons, you, you know how to feed now, and you know a bit how to train, but now you're not too successful. So now you go out of your own area and you go to a different combine uh, and you find a pigeon guy that has a good race record and a good breeding record on a course similar to your own. And you acquire some pigeons from that gentleman and bring them into your area. And you know, and those are the basic steps of progressing to be a better pigeon flyer. Yeah, no, good point. Um, Kelly's also asking, for a new flyer, buying pedigree pigeons to stock your loft is a nightmare. 
suggestions for starting out? Um, if you don't get gift pigeons and, 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 you, and you can't uh, acquire pigeons from another area and you're only looking, you only have pedigrees to, uh, at your availability, then look for the performance. Uh, two or three of the four grandparents got to have bread, bread of 300 mile, bread of 500, or one of 300, one of 500 both the parents, bred or won. So the key being performance. I stay away from bred for stock. If you look in some pedigrees, there isn't a performance, a breeding performance or a racing performance until you hit the great grandparents. Well, that's a guy that went out and bought a bunch of expensive pigeons at one time and has bred three generations of bred for stock to sell because of the name. I don't buy those pigeons. I want, like I said, I go back as far as the four grandparents and at least two out of the four of those grandparents has got to show, show some breeding or racing performance and that'll up your odds of, of getting good pigeons. Absolutely, great answer. Uh, Neil is asking, what is the future of pigeon racing in Canada and the world? Um, how do you see it or, or from when you started uh, how do you see it changing or evolving? I think that's a great question. Well, you know, we've, we've all beaten this one to death uh, over the last 20 years. My personal opinion is, unless pigeon flyers, the old timers like myself, or even the guys in their 40s and 50s, uh, if they don't learn to change, it's going to continue to degrade. Um, for example, you know, our group out here said, okay, let's fly old birds and young birds together. How do we do it? They didn't know how. I said, okay, I'll, let's try it this way. Let's let them all up together. Let's separate the results in the race sheet. I can also, on the, wind, on the wind speed program, I can give a combination, average speed, champion bird, and champion loft with young and old birds combined. The wind speed program does that, as well as I can separate them, okay? This is called thinking out of the box. But what's happening right now is nobody wants to take on the working positions in the club or the combine. We all know it's a hassle to get somebody to do this, to do that. It's always the same people doing it year in and year out. So after a while, those people say to themselves unconsciously or verbally, if I got to do all the work, we're going to do it my way. And if I say we don't change, guess what? We ain't going to change. But if you got a progressive person in there that says, okay, nobody wants to do the work. We're going to do it my way, but I want to change things. I think we could do better doing this, doing that, doing that. So the answer to the question is, if you let the same people that don't think out of the box run things forever, it's going down. If you get some good, healthy thinking people at the top doing these jobs, then you're going to have a good healthy organization and it's going to move ahead um close-minded people are the detriment to the sport no i i agree uh you know 100 hello i i think uh can, yeah, can you guys can, hear me yeah yeah we can okay hear you. i want to i want to thank ian sybil for having to call me on the show and ruining the, the call in there but now i've got a new i'm on another phone so thank you guys i have been listening i've been paying attention Oh, good. Keep going. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, Dave, I also agree with you. I think it's good to have a, a good uh, new fresh set of eyes um, in every few years, a new group uh, in a combine or situation to look at things with a fresh set of eyes that maybe, you know, the people who are doing it now maybe don't see things that way. And, you know, so then every few years you just get a fresh group of people freshening things up uh i think that that's a great idea i think people who are in it too long uh, I, you know it's difficult it's difficult uh you get complacent i think is what i'm trying to say yeah what i what i've noticed is when somebody holds a position of power too long they take ownership of it and they don't listen to anybody because they've been there long enough that they figure they own it and and if they don't want to change because they're happy with the way it's going and there's no hassles, then they're going to keep it that way, right? right. For their own personal comfort level. So 
how do you, I, I think what we need to do in our combines in our, uh, now you can't really do it in the club because clubs are small and there's only so many workers. Uh, but on a combine level, in a bigger, I think there should be a sunset on how long you can be a president and then, you know, have a new guy come in just like our federal elections. Uh, only have a combine president there for four years, five years tops. I mean, I was president of the Up North Combine for around 10 years. Uh, and it was under my watch that we brought in the big trailer. Me and Jimmy McLean brought that trailer in from Michigan. The uh, Toronto Federation trailer had a broken axle. It was broke. The big sport was falling apart. Um, they talked me into being president of the Up North Combine back in 1980-something, five or six. So we held a raffle. We held a draw. We sold off the big screen TV. All the clubs in the Up North Combine threw in four, five, six, seven thousand dollars. We had a raffle. We made another twenty thousand dollars, and we bought a uh, thirty-nine thousand dollar trailer that holds uh, thirty-two hundred pigments. That's the big trailer the UNC has now. And then over the course of three years, we paid back all the clubs. Um, you know, we had to raise trailer fees. We had to generate a cash flow. So guess what? Trailer fees got to go up. So we, but now that trailer that the UNC has, uh, the I was originally a part of uh, acquiring. Uh, it's paid for and, and it's going and going and going. Now they have another one that they, they bought. And it's my understanding they have 80000 or so in the bank. Uh, fine. Um, I can see having a floater of about thirty to $40,000 a year uh, for startup costs and everything else in an organization as I have But you don't need $80,000 sitting there. Uh, they should take that eighty thousand dollars and do some major support promotion. Because the Upnorth Combine is not the biggest combine in Canada anymore. I know they say it there was at one time two hundred members. I think Hamilton Taylor is probably the biggest combine in Toronto right now, from the way I see the baseball team So you gotta be progressive. That's the bottom line. Yeah, we we we, we definitely need 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 some uh, uh, to evolve somehow. Uh, and, and get thinking outside the box, uh, but it, that's very hard to change the old. It seems to be the old ways. Yeah, and, and I and I'm not being negative towards nope. any of the leaders, the organizations right now. I'm I'm just ca calling it as I see it, and uh, you know, so I'm not fingering anybody or being negative towards any one person. Agreed. So I think uh, we're going to wrap up this show. Uh, Ryan seems to be having some camera issues. Uh, great job, Dave. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on our first episode of Coffee Talk. I think uh, you know, some great questions from the audience. Hopefully everybody enjoyed the chat. Hopefully we can have you on again this season. And anybody else that uh, might be interested in coming on Coffee Talk and chit-chatting, please oh let us know. Uh, we're going to try and make this a weekly kind of uh, feature, right, Ryan? Yeah, I think I think this was fun. Again, uh, we're trying to promote the sport in any way that we can, and uh, I think this was really good. I think the people enjoyed it. I know I did. I learned a lot today. And guys, uh, I've had pigeons thirty-eight years, and I'm always learning. Uh, you can learn if you're willing to listen. You're going to learn, but you got to listen. <laughs> so, thank you, Dave, for yeah. for everything that you've uh, you, you've done here today. It was it was excellent. Well, I, I enjoyed myself, and uh, I enjoy uh, uh, bouncing ideas off, uh, and I enjoy sharing uh, my knowledge. Um, as I said earlier in, in the show, when I started, nobody told you nothing. Well, guess what, people? I'm an open book. Any new guy that wants to know something, I'll gladly tell you the way I do it, the way I uh, was successful with it. And, uh, and I really like this format of, uh, of the coffee talk. It's good. Uh, again, it's a groundbreaker. Uh, I tip my hat to uh, Feathers Elite and the Pioneer Club uh, for their innovative uh, thinking. Fantastic. And I got my yeah, you got your shirt on. Shoe on. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> hey, oh, Dave, don't worry. We're, we're, we're sending you the, the sweater of your, what was it, 22nd Pigeon? That clock yeah. here the other day. Yeah, yeah. Or you're getting uh, your, your, your Pigeon Boss uh, sweater. Um, well, I, I I got a Pigeon Boss hat that I bought my last order from the products I got. From you. Well, there. Now you'll match. And I got the Pigeon Boss mug. Yeah. <laughs> so you're you're good to go. Um, so we want to thank everybody for tuning in on this broadcast. Ryan, I think you're going to bring the birds in 
And are we training today or what are we doing? Uh, yeah, we're going to train today. We're going to bring them in when they're ready to come in. Some have come in. Some want to play around. That's fine. We're going to bring them in. Uh, we're going to basket them up. They may have a little bit later of a training toss today, and they come back a little bit lighter feed today to get them back onto that schedule for tomorrow. Uh, again, we like to loft fly them in the morning, bring them in, basket them, train them, give them their feed, and then I like to get them out at night just to get them going again, get them out for a little loft fly. Um, so we're going to do that. Uh, just sort of stick with us. It all really depends on how they come in. We'd like to get them to 15 kilometers again today. Uh, but again, it's going to all depend on how they come in, which they are. They are going to come in. Just uh, have to be a bit patient. Uh, again, the auction uh, for the five birds is at $350 right now by Bill Wima. Anyone wants to bid, you have up till 8 o'clock tonight when we do our show. So the bidding will continue right up till then when we close it off here on, on the line. Uh, and that's about it, Alia. Eh, I think that's it. We're going to wrap this up. So stick with our page. Uh, Ryan, you're just, just going to play it by ear today, right? Yeah, we're going to play it by ear. Um, and just, we'll just play it by ear. That's fine. We want to, we want to thank Dave Ottaway again for uh, joining us for this morning's Coffee Talk. Um, and that's it, Ryan, right? Anything else you want to say? Yeah, that's it. No. Thank, th th thank, you, for, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank All you right, guys. Time. Thanks. And thanks, everyone, for your support and answering the questions. That was good. Uh, we like to see the support. So wishing everybody a happy Sunday. I'm Leah. That's Ryan. And we were with Dave from the Pioneer Invitational. Thanks for flying with us.